You know, I've occasionally been asked whether the U.S. government agencies that deal with problems like Gulf War illness have been honest uh, about the causes. And I have to say that, no, they have not been completely honest and candid about the multiple causes of Gulf War illness. reason to believe that some of these illnesses may be the result of exposure to chemical and biological agents in that region. This contamination could have occurred in several ways, either through direct exposure from chemical or mixed agent weapons, or from the fallout as Allied forces bombed Iraqi chemical and biological weapons plants, throwing hazardous debris up into the weather fronts, which continuously moved down over our troops. Deputy Defense Secretary John White told the Presidential Advisory Committee on Gulf War-related illnesses that U.S. troops destroyed Iraqi rockets, which contained nerve agents. Were biological weapons used by Saddam Hussein during the Gulf War? The Pentagon won't tell, but some veterans say otherwise. We were led to believe that our soldiers in the first Gulf conflict were not exposed to biological weapons by Iraq. What is the truth? Is it possible that many of those weapons of mass destruction, the chemical and biological agents, actually caused Gulf War syndrome? I was exposed to daily mortar and rocket attacks um, when the helicopters flew over the base, the Apaches and the uh, Cobras, there was a stench that blew up from the sand and um, we never figured out what it was. Um, but I got a bunch of sores from that um, on my skin, um, my feet um, for, for months on end. One of the jobs I was given one day was asked to take my native divers and dive upon a Scud missile that had just dropped down into the port. I refused to put my divers on site because of the fish that I saw floating around in the bay. I studied marine biology in the University of California and decided that the, it wasn't from percussion that these fish were dying from, nor was it from the fuel that was in the rocket. I had determined that I felt it was a chemical agent. As uh, we see, most of our patients now admitted that these things is due to gastroenteritis. That is, there is an inflammation or infection in the uh, gastrointestinal tract. And the most common cause here is the infection due to uh, water, waterborne disease. That is being the improper sterilization of water for drinking in our city before, because yeah, the, 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 the war of pollution. So if we can see that these soldiers say they were exposed to chemical and biological weapons in the first Gulf conflict, why would we deny it? Is it possible that many of those weapons of mass destruction, the biological agents, were given to Iraq by companies in the United States? Well, there is absolutely no doubt that the United States government aided and abetted Saddam Hussein's chemical and biological warfare programs. We know that the Commerce Department issued licenses uh, to uh, various American companies to ship dual-use chemical or biological components to Iraq during the 1980s. And one of the biggest uh, scandals, I think, in all of this is that one of the entities that was shipping pathogens, biological pathogens, to Iraq was the Center for Disease Control. In doing that, we created essentially our own Frankenstein in the Persian Gulf. That's really what it boils down to. Ironically,
Historically, Iraq was considered an ally of convenience during the Iran-Iraq War. By the time the Gulf War began, Iraq had produced 1,500 gallons of anthrax and botulism, a formidable arsenal. So not only did uh, Europe and the United States sell to Iraq the capacity for biological warfare and chemical warfare and possibly even some nuclear potential capacity, but the United States military gave to Saddam Hussein military intelligence so he could use these chemical weapons on the Iranian troops coming into the country, the young, often young revolutionary guards. One guy told me how he found a bullet, a shell, and the spent cartridge had on it, made in St. Louis. It broke his heart to see that the U.S. was working against their own troops. So when the first Gulf War rolled around, and as the units from the 82nd Airborne began to roll across Iraq and see all of these known chemical weapons storage sites, they weren't told that they were chemical weapons storage sites. They were just told they were ammunition depots. Even though CENTCOM, uh, General Schwarzkopf's staff, had knowledge that the, some of those places were known storage facilities. Now, how did we know that? Well, we had human spies that were basically passing that kind of information. So that was one of the major indicators that we had that the weapons were actually forward deployed. And they blew up those depots. It is now known and proven that the destruction by the Allies of nerve, chemical, and biological agents during the first Gulf War exposed our GIs to these dangerous elements. Could this have caused Gulf War Syndrome? We contaminated everybody in theater to some extent or another. We used protective overgarments, boots, masks. I don't think you have seen a single battle scene from the Desert Storm War where our troops were not in mop gear. DOD knew all the way back to 1988 with this report that dusty agents would penetrate our chemical suits in such profusion under such low wind conditions as to make our chemical suits totally and utterly useless. They still deployed us with this equipment. That, to me, is criminal negligence. They were not prepared. They had no chemical suits that were acceptable for that area or for chemicals or biologicals. In fact, later on, Isratex, the company that provided 800,000 of those chemical suits, was found to have provided defective suits. Once the cat was out of the bag, the policymakers decided that the best way to say that nothing had happened to soldiers was to develop a computer model. And in their first model run, they said potentially 50 people may have been exposed. They went back and then they came back uh, several months later and said maybe 500 people had been exposed. Then they increased it to over 1,000, then 5,000, and then around 10,000, then around 20,000. It kept growing and growing. And then we learned that maybe uh, some of the um, biological and chemical plants that we blew up, that, that the plumes from those explosions went towards our troops, not away from our troops. And now they're acknowledging that it was low level, but possibly our 100,000 plus of our troops were exposed to, to that kind of um, exposure. A top scientist at the Veterans Administration said today that soldiers face no greater long-term risk than would a factory worker in a chemical plant. We feel that these are levels that are very near what people would be exposed to occupationally without having ill effects. We've had a couple chemical alarm scares where we've had to put on our mask and our full chemical suit and uh, they all happen to be false alarms. There's little, little trace chemical in the air but we think it's because the plants have been blown up in Iraq and, and the air is filtering this way. They say it's not enough to hurt you though. There is evidence that there were 14,000 chemical alarms that went off during the first Gulf War, all of which were ruled as negative by the Department of Defense. We know from the troops that were there that there were, in fact, positive alarms or positive findings 
We know that the Fox vehicles, which are especially utilized for this purpose, found the traces of chemicals.